What's up, Reckless? Yeah. This is called the spinning fist wheel. Makes you look super awesome when you do this. Hey, what's going on? It is Todd back with you for another week. We're excited that you are with us. I wasn't even on the video last week. Uh, and so I'm sure that you missed that. Now you get to see my ugly mug again. We are glad that you are back with us for another week watching this video, whether you're on our virtual group or whether you're watching this during the week. So excited that you have joined in with us. And um, we've got some great things coming up, some really exciting things that we, we have coming up, including something that registration just opened for called Rush. All right, so there you go. It is gonna be the best week of your summer. Registration is now live, it's open. Go to westridge.com slash rush, sign up. You can pay in full when you register. So by now, the first 100 spots are probably full by the time you watch this. But go ahead and, and go online, sign up. $4.99 is the cost. You can sign up now through the end of March. March the 30th is the last day to sign up. And it's gonna be the best week of your summer if if uh, cost is an issue for you, we do have scholarships available. So go check all of that out. All that information and more is on the website. We want you to come and be a part of an amazing week. So also next week is our last week in our series that we're in, Relationships 101. Then the following week, we've got Super Bowl Sunday. So February 13th, we will not have a, a video. We won't, have, we won't be meeting for Reckless. We'll have a Super Bowl party, which you are more than welcome to come and join us for that. Uh, we'll have a great time watching the Super Bowl, eating food, hanging out, and uh, we'll do something special at halftime for our Nicaragua team because that next Sunday, we're going to be heading to Nicaragua, all 58 of us. So jump in, come hang out with us on Super Bowl Sunday, but we will not have a, um, a, a video for that week. And then we'll be back for our, our next week's video will be on February the 27th, a new series that we're going to be kicking off. And so we're excited about what is coming down over the next few weeks. So right now it is time to jump into week number four of our series, Relationships 101. All right, so next to last week in our series, Relationships 101, over the course of this series, we're trying to give you some just core truths to help you navigate through dating and relationships and ultimately marriage and to help us understand how we can do relationships in a way that honors God. And so just to recap over the last few weeks, the first week, kind of our main point was that you were not made primarily for a relationship with a guy or girl. You were made for a relationship with God, that that's the most important relationship. And until we get a relationship with God right, we can't get a relationship with a guy or a girl right. And so that's the foundation to find our identity and purpose and value and all of that in God, in that relationship that we were created for and not in another human being. So then week two, we talked about this idea of singleness. And so what we said was singleness is freedom with a purpose to pursue an undistracted devotion to Jesus and become the type of person that is ready for a healthy relationship. So not looking at singleness as like, what's wrong with me, but rather seeing it as a gift to pursue full devotion to Jesus and to become the kind of people that God's called us to be. And so not to jump just into any relationship because we're scared of being single, but rather just being content with where God had us, has us, following after Jesus and making that relationship the main thing and being okay with that while we're still growing and maturing as the person that God ultimately has called us to be. Now, last week, we kind of built on top of that and talked about dating and kind of dating with a purpose. So the, the focus was, and the main point was, dating exists for evaluation. 
It's not a status to dwell in, but a process to move through. So the, the purpose of dating is for us to evaluate, is this the person that I want to spend the rest of my life with? And so not just dating just to date, just to hang out with random guys or girls or whatever, and, or date for seven years like, and with no intent, no purpose behind it, but rather to date with purpose. And so if you're not at that point in your life, whether you're a teenager, 14, 15, 18, whatever, then our encouragement to you is to not date until you're ready to find that person to evaluate, am I ready to take steps forward towards spending the rest of my life with them in a marriage relationship? Now, in his book that we've been using as kind of the guide, uh, Single Dating Engaged Married. So Ben Stewart, here's the book that we've been using as a guide, which you can pick this up on Amazon or uh, anywhere you get your books, which is just Amazon. Um, so one of the, the cool th illustrations that he gives in this book is he talks, about, he paints this picture of us in a race pursuing after Jesus, right? And that's our purpose, to know God and to pursue him, to walk with him and to chase after him. And so he kind of paints this picture like we're going to be chasing after Jesus and making that the focus. And as we're doing that, there's going to be people who are going to come into our life and they may be going cross our paths and go in a totally different direction than us. And in our pursuit of Jesus, what we've got to be careful of is not stopping that pursuit because we see that guy or that girl that's attractive. And even if they're, especially if they're heading in the opposite direction and just kind of veer off course from what God's called us to do because we want to chase and pursue after another guy or a girl. And so he says, man, they may be heading in a different direction, different purpose, like not even knowing God at all. So how much sense does it make if our primary thing is to pursue Jesus, to stop that and chase and pursue somebody that may lead us down to a totally different destination? So he says, like, pursue Jesus, chase after him. And as you do that, there may be other people that kind of enter the, the race with you and enter the picture with you. And you're running, they're running at the same pace after Jesus and same pursuit of Jesus that you and I are. And so he says, sometimes those people that you're running with, they may be dateable. And you may look and go, man, he's attractive or she's good looking. And, and so it's, it doesn't, you don't stop your pursuit of Jesus. That's the main thing. But now all of a sudden there may be people that join you in community, friendships, and maybe even dating relationships that are, those people are pursuing you with the same pace and same focus that you are. And he says some of those may be dateable. And, and if they are, like you evaluate that, but don't, don't stop your pursuit. Don't, don't stop and don't force anything. Continue to pursue after Jesus and let God bring people into your life at the right time when he feels like you're ready for it. And so in that pursuit, like you and I may, as, as we're kind of pursuing Jesus, we may find somebody that's like, man, they're dateable. And then all of a sudden we enter the evaluation process. We date them to see, is this somebody that I could spend the rest of my life with? And maybe they have great character and we have great chemistry with them. And so maybe we're trying to see, do I want to spend the rest of my life with them? And ultimately, am I ready to get married? What? I'm engaged. <laughs> I'm engaged, I'm getting married. <laughs> so let's say we get to that, to that point. And the question is, how can we have a marriage that lasts? So the first thing that we've got to understand, if that is our desire, if we want that, we crave that, is to understand this, that marriage was designed by God. Marriage was God's idea. It was God's plan. And so because of that, the highest potential will be achieved and the greatest satisfaction will be experienced when we focus on God's design for marriage. Because God gave marriage as a gift. It was his idea. It was his intention. He designed it. And so if we want to experience the best of what marriage can be, a marriage that will last, then we've got to follow the creator's original intent for that. What did God desire for marriage? When he designed it, what was the purpose? And to pursue that together. Now, maybe that's the reason why there's so many broken marriages and relationships in our culture. Because what we've done is we've taken the picture of marriage and we like the idea of it, and then we've redefined the rules. We've kind of thrown God's intent out and said, I don't really need God in the picture. And so what we've done is we've redefined good and evil or marriage specifically 
in our own eyes. And we've scrapped what God says and we've tried to redefine it for ourselves. And the result of that is a lot of heartache, a lot of brokenness. Maybe you are a byproduct of some of that heartache and brokenness. Maybe you look at your own family situation and your mom and dad may be divorced or you look at our culture as a whole and you just see marriage as an epic failure because of all of the broken relationships. It might have even caused you to give up on marriage as a whole and to feel like it's some failed idea that it could never work the way that we would hope that it could. But see, God didn't design marriage to, to give us a lot of pain and brokenness. God gave us marriage as a gift for our flourishing, for us to experience his blessing. And so in Genesis chapter two, you go back to the beginning and God created all of creation. And then he created humankind and he made Adam man in his own image. And he looked at creation and he said, it is good. But then he's, there was one thing that he said was not good. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. And so as a result of that, God created woman from man. And we read in Genesis 2.24 says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. So God created this holy union between man and woman for it to be an incredible experience and they perfectly fit together and they complement each other in, in so many different ways that they are a complement to each other to, as a blessing and a gift to each other. And so the, they've also, what God did is he gave each of them, male and female, specific roles in a marriage relationship. What was the purpose of that? so that they could experience God's best. And not just so that we would understand that marriage was designed by God, but also so that we'd understand that marriage is meant to display something about God. So in order to see how that plays out, one of the passages that we can look at is Ephesians chapter five. And the apostle Paul is, is giving, based on Genesis two, the relationship and the roles uh, between male and female, between husband and wife. And listen what he says in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 21. He says, And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. So the Apostle Paul uses the... the the picture of husband and wife to give instruction on how we're to honor and serve and love each other within a marriage relationship. And what he says is ultimately each of our roles that we play, husband's role, the wife's role, is to reflect the goodness and the glory of God. It is to paint a picture of who God is and more specifically who Jesus is. That we're to give a picture of what Jesus has done for us. And so he says, submit to each other. Then he says specifically, wives, submit to your husbands. Now that doesn't mean that the husband rules and reigns over the wife. It means just like, you know, any other part in kind of in our culture, like if you've got a job, you submit to your boss. It doesn't mean that your boss is more important than you. It means you submit to the authority that he has based on that company and for the structure of that workplace in order for it to function the best as possible. The same would be if you're in the, in the military or whatever, you've got a commanding officer. It doesn't mean that that commanding officer is more important, but it does mean that in order for that military to, branch to, to flourish or to experience unity or whatever, there's got to be a, a submission to authority. Um, and so he says the same is true in a marriage relationship. The husband's not more important than the wife. 
The husband's role is not to dominate the wife or to make her do what he, what he wants. She's not to submit to him in some way like she's less than, but rather God is holding the husband accountable and responsible to, for leadership over the family. And so the wife's responsibility is to submit to that authority in a way that honors God. By doing that, you are, you are reflecting the goodness of God. I mean, you think about what Jesus did for us. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father by coming and giving up his life for us. It was God's will. It was God's plan. And so Jesus submitted to that. It doesn't mean that Jesus is not equal to God. Certainly he is. He's the son of God. But he submitted to the, in obedience to what the Father wanted. And so Paul is saying, in the same way, wives, submit to your husbands. But then he also has even more instruction for the husband because he holds men accountable, the husband accountable for leadership in the family. And so he looks at the husband and he says, you've got to love and honor and serve your wife just like Jesus served the church. How did Jesus serve the church? He gave up his life for us. He sacrificed for us. He initiated for us. He poured out his love and his goodness, his own life for us. And so Paul is saying in the same way, Husbands, when you serve your wife and honor and love her and put her needs ahead of your own, you are reflecting the goodness of Jesus and what he's done for the church. So that's the way that we can have as the foundation a marriage that can last is we reflect who Jesus has called us to be and see the design that God created for marriage to flourish. So the main point for us this week God designed marriage to be a picture of Jesus and a pursuit of Jesus. So here's my challenge to you as we close this week's video. Are you somebody that desires marriage, desires to find that someone that you want to spend the rest of your life with, as most of us do, most of your generation still does believe in marriage, wants to find that? So my encouragement to you, whether you're 14, 15, if you're about to graduate high school, the more you pursue Jesus and that relationship with him, the greater the picture you will get of what a healthy marriage will look like because it's all based on Jesus. And so if you want to have a marriage that lasts, pursue Jesus in your relationship with him with everything that you've got. When it comes to dating, a relationship and the, that guy or that girl that you're gonna that you're gonna date hold that standard high make sure that he or she is pursuing Jesus and following Jesus just like you are and and as a result of that it doesn't mean that it's gonna be foolproof but it does mean that if both of you are pursuing Jesus and following him you're he's gonna give you a picture of what a marriage looks like and you're both, as you pursue Jesus, Jesus is going to be reflected in that marriage relationship through the roles that you play, and you'll have an opportunity to experience the goodness and the gift that marriage can be. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for the gift of marriage. God, I know it has been perverted and manipulated and twisted into many other different things in our culture today that has caused us maybe in some ways to think of it as not that big of a deal or not important. But God, it was such a big deal, it was so important that you established it at the beginning of creation with Adam and Eve and for that to be a picture of how we're to live our lives and what marriage can look like. And so God, I pray for students who are watching this, God, that they would pursue you, that they would chase after you. And as a result of that, God, you would give them a picture of what marriage can be. And God, that they would experience your blessing and your gift in this way down the road. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, so thank you so much for joining this week's video. We're going to turn you guys loose to your small groups, your virtual groups. Hope you have an amazing week and we will see you back here next week for our final week in Relationships 101.